We're sitting down with a round table of local journalists discussing the 2020 election, past, present, and of course, the future. That's this week on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt and additional supporting sponsors. Well, many agree the 2020 election has been like no other election our state and possibly our country has ever experienced. From COVID-19 restrictions changing how we could vote to unprecedented turnout to unexpectedly close wins from the top all the way down the ballot, to recent legal challenges and potential recounts. Well, we're very lucky in that we've had some of the state's best journalists covering it all. And given the story of the 2020 election is far from over, we're equally lucky to have some of these journalists joining our roundtable here today. To give us more perspective and take a deeper dive into some of the key stories, please welcome April Corbin Gurness, reporter for the Nevada Current, Colton Lockheed, political reporter for the Las Vegas Review-Journal, Megan Messerly, political reporter for the Nevada Independent, and John Sadler, political reporter for the Las Vegas Sun. You know, so much could be classified as surprising in this election to maybe the layperson, and maybe if you've been following the election more closely, maybe some of the results uh, are not as surprising, but we wanted to get your take. What has really surprised you? Let's go around our whole virtual table and ask that question. Megan, let's start with you. What have you found that's been most surprising about the election cycle here in 2020? Yeah, so I think one of the most surprising things to me has been the national interest in, in this election that sort of cropped up only in the days after uh, Election Day. Obviously, you know, Nevada has been a battleground for, you know, many cycles now. Uh, but if you looked at many of the articles and much of the national coverage, you know, leading up to uh, our election, Nevada wasn't even on many of those lists of battleground states. It was pretty much, you know, Arizona was the big focus um, in the West. And obviously, Arizona was an important state. But we saw on election night as those votes were trickling in, the margin between Joe Biden and Donald Trump narrowed. And we we're at this 0.6 percentage point margin. And then, you know, we heard, OK, no more results for a day. And sort of the country was on pins and needles waiting for Nevada's results to come in. And suddenly Nevada became you know, much more important than I think, you know, I was anticipating than a lot of national folks were anticipating. Obviously, as Nevada reporters, we, you know, we always care and we're always paying attention. But uh, I was not expecting this sort of national lens uh, to focus in on Nevada and our, you know, six uh, small number of electoral votes to suddenly become uh, that important. And so I think that was a really interesting development. But it kind of just went to show, I think, uh, you know, we are an important state. You can't take anything for granted here. I mean, Democrats and Republicans alike have been saying that, you know, there's this conversation about Nevada is a blue state, but Democrats have been saying it takes a lot of work to make Nevada a blue state. You can't take that for granted. And Republicans, too, uh, have said, you know, we see the Democratic machine, you know, they, they turn out their voters, but we're, you know, we're, we're going to give Nevada a shot as well. And I think that's why you saw the result that, that you did here, especially at the top of the ticket that, you know, pretty, still pretty narrow margin, you know, 2.39 percentage point margin, um, you know, even slimmer than Hillary Clinton's win over Donald Trump in, in 2016. So I think that that was one of the biggest surprises that that jumped out to me. Absolutely. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about the impact of that uh, on some of the down ballot uh, uh, races as well and some of the measures too. Uh, John, let's get your perspective too. What was most surprising to you covering uh, our entire sec our entire election process here? And let's not only talk about just the last several weeks, so we can go all the way back and talk about the caucus and the primaries here as well. Well, I, I think Megan kind of hit on it there. It, 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 we cut to the point where if we're going back what AP said, that we would have been the the last state that would have been called for Joe Biden and could have potentially handed him the presidency. I think I made a joke on Twitter that as soon as um, I think it was Pennsylvania was called, he had it and everybody just kind of stopped paying attention. But I, I do think that on we had some state polls that were a little, I think, well, not overzealous, that might be the wrong word, but um, a little more bullish for Biden than he uh, the actual turnout um, turned out to be. Um, but I think that especially if you look nationwide, uh, state polls did a little better in some places and a little worse in, in other places. I mean, if you look at Georgia, it was pretty much on the money. If you look at Nevada, it was a little bit better. Um, but if you look at Wisconsin and Michigan, 
it wasn't great. Um, they had Biden winning by much more than he won those states. So I think one of the, the takeaways from this uh, for me is how we judge battleground states like Nevada. I know Megan said this, and I think she tweeted it on election night that, you know, people have this this comforting view of Nevada or Democrats, at least comforting view for Democrats, that this is a, a, a strictly blue state. And, and it's really not. And, and I think that it will be a battleground um, going forward. April, let's get your take. Biggest surprises. Um, you know, I'll say that I was pleasantly surprised at how, I'll say, peaceful and smooth the entire election process went, um, given that the state legislature, uh, you know, passed their special elections bill fairly late into the elections process. Elections officials were really uh, up against a deadline in terms of getting the process started for preparing their ballots and getting them ready because it's a months long process. Um, so there was a worry that Nevada had moved to all mail ballots too too late in the season, but you know they pulled it off largely. There were concerns before the election about you know right wing militia types uh, intimidating voters on election day. That got a lot of coverage um, given how much disinformation. Uh, has existed here in Nevada that's pushed by prominent people uh, within uh, Nevada politics. And that didn't uh, materialize. We did see a few stop the steal kind of little rallies outside of the elections office uh, while they were counting. But largely there were there was no violence. There was no uh, widespread voter intimidation and and mail ballots went smoothly. There have been, of course, lawsuits alleging um, irregularities or fraud. Um, and that conversation still happens. But when it comes down to it, um, all of those even have so far uh, been dismissed or thrown out. And uh, the, the institutions have held. The, the process has gone smoothly and it, it, it's doing what it said. Like Megan alluded to, the whole nation was watching. They were making fun of Nevada for not counting faster. But um, elections officials had, had expressed that that was going to be the timeline. They stuck to that timeline. And um, and they did the process that they said they were going to do. So I think that for me has been a pleasant surprise um, that it wasn't uh, it wasn't a mess, <laughs> really. Colton, let's get your perspective. You've covered everything from uh, the presidential races all the way down to the state to our local races as well here, um, and then of course uh, extensive coverage in uh, our legislation. Uh, biggest surprises? I think for me. Uh, it kind of building off what John mentioned is kind of Nevada really showing its independent streak once again in this election. Biden did win the election or Biden did win the presidential election here. And, but down the ballot, Republicans really made up a lot of ground, um, especially in the state house where they had struggled in recent elections. Um, you know, they broke the Democrats supermajority hold on the assembly by swinging more than uh, I think more well more than the seats that they needed and did it in pretty powerful fashion in one race that they lost in 2018. They ended up swinging back and winning that assembly district by more than I, I think about 2000 votes, uh, which is a pretty massive swing. And, and that really just showed, I think, a kind of a renewed effort from uh, from certain groups, of, certain groups of Republicans, certain sects of the Repo Republican Party that they know that this is not a blue state yet. This is not a state that's gone fully blue. This is not a state that is fully Democrat. They still have a chance here to maintain, to have some sort of power, have some sort of say over legislation. And I think that is something we'll kind of look at looking into 2021. Um, you know, they're, they're still in the minority in both uh, chambers, but by not being in the super minority in one chamber now, they have quite a bit more say and a little more control over certain things. And Colton and Megan, you've both covered this, and let's get both of your perspectives here. Where is the GOP? How, where is confidence for? We got midterm elections just right around the corner here in 2022. Um, and then looking forward to 2024, do the Republicans in Nevada feel very confident they can get more legislative seats uh, and maybe get some of our, our, um, our bigger ticket? We have the, governor, the governor's race, of course, coming up uh, during the midterm. Colton, let's get your perspective first. Well, I think so. I think the successes they've had this this in this cycle i know that their goal was to flip a certain amount of seats uh at least two in the state house and they did more than that they flipped four and so that that gives them a lot of confidence going forward that they can still may, still pull a lot of those independent voters and that there are still a lot of voters that aren't fully swayed by the democratic party here and i think that is something that they're confident in the question is 
is what happens going forward with statewide leadership. Um, it, you know, there is a, a bit of a, uh, a divide within the Republican Party of the conservative wing and you have the more moderate wing. And there's been this kind of push and pull uh, for power within the party trying to determine kind of where they go. And I think you're going to see that kind of play spill over into the 2022 midterms and into the statewide races and as to um, what where the candidates or what candidates will see run for governor and other races like that. Um, because as in 2018, Democrats swept the statewide races here in all but one race. So I think that's I think that they feel confident going in. But I think we're, we're still waiting to see what kind of candidates they can recruit to, for those big time for those bigger races. Megan, I'd like to get your take, too, and it's something that Colton said right there, the type of candidate that we might have uh, come 2022 um, and even our 2024 elections. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question of who will run for that seats. And, and like Colton was alluding to, the difficulty that Republicans have uh, is the fact that there's this sort of, you know, more conservative faction and then a probably a more moderate faction that would probably be more likely to win those statewide races. But getting through a Republican primary is really difficult uh, for those, you know, moderate candidates because because uh, historically, you know, at least in the last couple of elections, we've seen the more conservative candidates um, prevail. On the other hand, you know, talking to Republicans, they are, you know, pretty optimistic about what happened this election cycle. I think it's really interesting if you zero in on some of these races um, up in northern Nevada, Washoe County. Uh, Heidi Ganser won her Senate District 15 race. At one point, Republicans were a little nervous about potentially losing that seat. Um, and she won that race even as Biden took Washoe County. And if you look at the precinct by precinct breakdown, you know, there are precincts that voted for both Heidi Ganser, a Republican, and Joe Biden, a Democrat. And that, you know, shows Republicans that you know, again, like Colin was saying, this is not a democratic state. There's there's room, you know, Nevadans are independent and they're going to be looking at, at the candidates, you know, more so than they're looking just at the party and voting straight down the party line. Also in Southern Nevada, another really interesting example is Senate District 5. That was a pickup for Republicans with Carrie Buck's uh, win there. That seat's currently held by uh, Democratic State Senator Joyce Woodhouse, who's termed out. That seat's really interesting because you have Carrie Buck, a Republican who won, and the two assembly districts that are nested inside it were won by Democrats, Leslie Cohen and then Elaine Marzola. Um, both those seats are, were currently held by Democrats. There was no change there. But to have a Republican winning in the state Senate uh, seat while you have these Democrats winning even further down the ticket was really interesting. And I, there, I think there's going to be a lot of analysis of sort of why that is. You know, Kerry Buck's well known in the district. But this shows Republicans that they can, you know, still win. They can beat Democrats in some of these seats. But the question is, okay, you win in these legislative seats, how do you translate that to statewide wins where it's, you know, much more difficult and you need to have, you know, a message that that unifies the state and sort of appeals to, you know, independent nonpartisan voters um, all over the state. And that's, I think that's the tougher battle. And have you talked to any campaign managers that have given you kind of any type of sense on how they think that can be done? Um, and I'm also wondering, uh, we've already talked about just where the independent vote, this moderate vote might, might lie here. Um, and if we can do it on a small scale, potentially, uh, could we see similar results statewide? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. And I think this is what the Republican Party was grappling a lot with in 2016, even before, you know, Donald Trump was, you know, elected the Republican presidential nominee, obviously went on to win the presidency. But there was this question of what does the future of the Republican Party look like? You know, you had candidates like Marco Rubio running, um, you know, a desire to see more female candidates run um, and sort of a different picture of what the Republican Party might look like. And so I know that conversation is happening here in Nevada as well, you know, names being tossed around for the governor's race, you know, you have um, obviously, you know, Dean Heller, who went through his U.S. Senate election, someone like Mark Hutchison, uh, former lieutenant governor, who's, you know, sort of, um, you know, well-known and well-respected. You have people who are in the state legislature, like Ben Kiefer or Heidi Ganser, who I mentioned. These are all sort of, um, you know, sort of more, more moderate folks, folks who've shown, you know, they're willing to work across party lines. And you can see those are the kind of candidates that are probably going to have a little bit more nonpartisan sort of moderate appeal might even be able to appeal to some of those, um, you know, left leaning nonpartisans or, or moderate Democrats, um, you know, depending on depending on how the race sort of plays out. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we have someone like Adam Laxalt who might run again, who's, um, you know, very conservative and has a lot of support within the Republican Party. And so, you know, you see people looking at the landscape and saying, OK, if someone like Adam Laxalt gets through the Republican primary, what are his shots in the statewide election? And this this is why, it, you know, comes down to those Republican primaries and those why that that's why those are so crucial because, you know, someone can win a Republican primary, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be the candidate who has that appeal to win statewide. 
John, I want to switch the conversation, something we already mentioned, talking about uh, the, the lack of a supermajority now in our, in our state legislation um, and the shift there. Uh, for one thing, we've got just around the corner, of course, is a, a legislative session at the beginning of uh, 2021 here. Um, it, a lot is being talked about, of course, because of COVID related to budget and revenue for the state. Uh, can you give us an idea of looking forward to that session, how important could a supermajority be, or what does it mean that we do not have one now? Well, it, the issue is, is that if Democrats had actually won the supermajority in both chambers, um, stereotypically they'd be a little more uh, open to raising revenue. We saw that this uh, over the summer in one of the special legislative sessions called. They were trying to raise the cap on mining taxes. There was a back and forth on earmarking that for education, and it, immediate, it didn't pass through the Senate. Um, it lost the Republican that uh, had previously said that he would support it and kind of went back and forth on that. And so going into this, we've got the potential for that mining, uh, mining tax cap increase to come back. We've got uh, sales and gaming tax increases brought forward uh, that would need a supermajority to pass. And in a legislative session like this, in which there's almost certainly going to be further budget cuts or, 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 or budget wrangling trying to, to make up some of the revenue loss due to the pandemic, without further revenue coming in, that makes it you know even harder to try to make up those holes. So it'll be interesting to see what Democrat strategy is to actually do that. April, I want to I want to talk a little bit more about some of the other Dan Pell at uh, races here, and let's talk about some of the measures. Uh, question one was something we had you on a previous show talking about uh, each one of the mm -hmm. questions. And question one seemed to be the one that was going to be the closest race. Uh, can you give us a little bit of insight on why uh, that was not successful. You know, um, question one, uh, which again was the, you know, a measure that would have removed the Board of Regents from the state constitution and, you know, given authority to the state legislature to uh, come up in statute the rules of governing um, and oversight and accountability for uh, the Nevada system of higher education. Um, and it was a very dense, uh, densely worded question. Um, the website, Ballotpedia, uh, you know, ranked it at a 39 grade level, like that's not even a, you know, that doesn't even exist. It was so high. Um, so you would need beyond a college level to sort of understand it readily. And, and that's, that's asking a lot of voters. So the, when, when there are confusing ballot measures, um, the instinct of voters is to vote no, because that's the status quo. I don't know about it. Or their instinct is to skip over it altogether. Um, and we saw, you know, tens of thousands of people skipped all of the ballot measures, um, but most of the more, but question one received the most skips, more people skipped that over than any of the other questions, uh, which sort of speaks, I think, to how confusing it was um, and how it's done and, and just how it was not able to register. It's a very complex message. Um, and, and I spoke with the campaign manager who ran the Yes on One campaign. And they, um, they actually saw, you know, they're always going to look for a silver lining. And in this case, their silver lining is that um, in, they say that in late uh, on election day and ballots that were received or sent right before election day, they polled really well. They were at like 60% approval among those voters. And they think that's uh, because they were able to reach those voters. They had a television campaign ad and they really ramped up because they got some last minute funds to uh, send their messaging out and maybe that helped and resonate. So their argument is that they could have passed um, the measure if they had had more money and if they had been able to reach further into the state. This, uh, if you look at a breakdown of the question one uh, results, it, it lost Washoe County and it lost all the rurals, uh, but it, it did okay in Clark County. Um, and say running a state campaign was really hard and they were, weren't were able to reach those. And if they could have, they could have pushed it a little bit further. So they do plan on revisiting that. Maybe they'll rewrite it somehow to be less confusing and less fewer words be lengthy. Um, but that's what they're looking at um, in terms of re regrouping after a, a really narrow loss because it was uh, just under 4,000 votes, I believe, and it was uh, less than a, it was three tenths of a percent in terms of the, the final outcome. Uh, so that's a really close race in an election season that has been unlike any other. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this goes forward. And it sounds like that, that we will see this question on future ballots, it sounds like. That's what they've said. Um, 
I mean, obviously that's easy to say. We'll see if there's momentum and all of that, but it is promising in terms of how close it was. This wasn't a blowout by any means. So they, they only have to move the needle a little bit to go further. And there are, you know, examples of uh, questions reappearing on ballots in slightly different wording um, that have passed before. So it's definitely, I think, something that's going to uh, come up again because we've seen that the Board of Regents uh, has... Uh, had a lot of high profile controversies over the years. They've had a lot of uh, heat on them and and that's not going to go away because that's been going on for you know decades here in Nevada. I want to go around our virtual table too. We've got about four or five minutes left and, and get some of your takeaways on, on kind of what the 2020 election means for you and how when you're looking forward to how you will be covering and what you will be covering uh, with upcoming elections, how that might change. And Megan, let's let's start with you. Key takeaways here. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously for, for all of us, this has been such a weird election year uh, covering an election in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, the entire format of the election has changed, right? You you had campaigns, you know, dot, uh, on the Democratic side, not not door knocking until, um, you know, late in the summer in the case of the culinary union or, you know, even into October for the Biden campaign while the Trump campaign was on the doors in in June. We just saw a really different campaign. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to know sort of, I think, well, we have some lessons learned learn from from this cycle just in terms of, of coverage and you know how do you cover a campaign when uh, people aren't available to us in the normal the normal ways right normally we'd be going out to all these different campaign events and and interviewing voters and obviously those existed to some extent but not to the extent they would have existed in in a normal campaign cycle and I know you know as reporters you know social distancing and, and doing all these different things it's just an entirely different way of reporting so I think it'll be interesting to see um, you know moving forward how the way this campaign was run informs the way that future you know midterm and the next presidential campaign are run at least in terms of voter outreach because we saw a lot more happen virtually and over the phone and in these spaces that are not public spaces not happening in person so I think it'll be really interesting to see sort of how that shifts the nature of the campaigns permanently uh, moving forward. And then the other thing that I'll be I'll be looking for is, you know, what happens uh, with with mail balloting. Right. We have this sort of experiment that happened this this cycle in terms of, um, you know, offering mail ballots to all active registered voters. There are other Western states who do this year after year. Is this something that becomes part of Nevada's permanent uh, tradition? Is there the appetite for that? I don't know. But, you know, now that Nevadans have a taste of it, they might not want to go back. So I'm really curious to see how that could change the nature of elections moving forward if that's a path that the state decides to go down. Colton, let's get your perspective. I think kind of building on that, I think I'm kind of curious to see if if Nevada does kind of stick with mail balloting, how that affects polling. And as John mentioned earlier, just kind of some of the struggles we've seen with polling on, over the last couple of election cycles. I'm kind of I'm really interested to see where that goes, where the whole polling system goes, especially in the presidential races. In 2018, it felt it felt like our the statewide polls and the midterms actually weren't that off. It felt like uh, the the final results ended up being fairly close. It's just weird to see that the presidential elections were so far off of a lot of the statewide polls. Um, uh, though we didn't have a ton of polling in the state, but I, I'm really curious because for so long we you know that's kind of how we track these races uh through and a lot of uh in a lot of stories and a lot of coverage it's you know we, we're looking at these snapshots of the races at various points of the campaign we start uh looking at even during primaries and things like that wonder how many candidates stop relying so much on those external polls or or even on internal polls and how much they just start relying more on just other types of metrics in terms of uh, like uh, voter tracking and things of that nature. And I, and I wonder how that changes our role in terms of like how we are able to track these races over that over that longer span. Hmm. John, your takeaways. Um, yeah, I kind of hopping off what Colton said, I, I'm interested in, you know, going forward, what are these elections going to look like in a, a, a when Trump's not on the, the ticket here or, or, or at least not this this overarching figure sitting in the White House. I mean, I know that there's been some social media rumors and stuff that he's going to run again in, in 2024, but we don't know that. And without him on the ticket, I'm, I'm curious if Republicans are going to move back to a, a kind of a pre-Trump, more moderate stance, or just kind of continue on with, with Trumpism. Uh, and what that means for their chances here in, in Nevada. Uh, we've He's kind of, 
I, I don't know going forward what this what these lawsuits mean. Are, are we going to normalize the fact that we can just tie up the next few months after an election and these legal challenges that really have not offered any evidence? They're, they're, they're essentially baseless. Uh, I haven't seen anything to, to back up the claims that are being made here. And so really what the, this means after a Trump loss, what does this mean for, for the future of the, the Republican Party? How are they going to or are they going to uh, reconfigure themselves? And April, I'm sorry, we got about 30 seconds left, but I wanted to get your takeaway as well. Yeah, I guess just to build off what I think John said, I think the, the legal coverage uh, of this is really telling and what uh, the, the local media needs to evaluate its role in, in unwittingly perpetuating misinformation and lies. I think, you know, a lot of outlets, including the ones represented here on this panel, did a great job of, of covering these lawsuits and, and pointing out that there were no, um, you know, claims. But a lot of media outlets didn't do that, and a lot of people missed that context. So what F, what impact does that misinformation campaign have in the future, and, and how can we as journalists uh, combat it and correct it? Because it, it could have a really long impact, I think. Well, thank you for joining us this week on Nevada Week. Now, for any of the resources that we've discussed on today's show, please visit our website at vegaspbs.org slash nevada-week. You can also always find us on social media at Nevada Week. Now tune in next week as we're bringing you a little bit of a different show for Nevada Week, a special Thanksgiving episode. We'll see you then. <laughs>